Hello again, everyone, and welcome to our last session of the 2022-2023 Forest and Climate Learning Exchange Series. I'm your host, Catherine Maloney, and I am the Interim Director of the Forest Carbon and Climate Program at Michigan State University. I want to give a quick thanks to our co-host, the Society of American Foresters, or SAF, SAF is the National Scientific and Educational Organization representing forestry and related natural resources professionals across the United States. Founded in 1900, SAF promotes science-based sustainable management and stewardship of the nation's public and private forests. Um, similarly, a thank you to our additional sponsors, NCX and Renew West. So for today's presentations, we will be discussing dimensions of urban and community forestry. We are honored to host Beatra Wilson, the Assistant Director of Urban and Community Forestry with the US Forest Service and our very own Dr. Asia Doughton from MSU Forestry Department. Thank you both for joining us today. Before we get started, I'd like to briefly share a, a few housekeeping details. Um, to automatically receive registration details and information regarding upcoming webinars, please join our mailing list by emailing forestc at msu.edu. A recording of the session along with a copy of the slides will be available on our website. And the presentations will be followed by a 10 to 15 minute question and answer session. Um, you can use the chat or Q&A function at the bottom of the Zoom interface to submit your questions at any point during the presentations. We will do our best to address as many questions as possible. And if you're calling in by phone and you can't use the chat function, um, you can also email forestc at msu.edu. So for continuing education credits, Attendees are qualified to receive CFE credit from SAF. The credits will be automatically applied if you registered for the event with the email associated with your SAF account. Similarly, attendees are qualified to receive CEU credits from ISA. Please email forestc at msu.edu with your CERT ID to receive those credits. And thank you for the patience with your patience with the housekeeping stuff. And I will now hand it over to Beatra Wilson. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Catherine. Apologies for the extra noise. I have a noisy bracelet on and I think I'm ready to go. I'm Beatra Wilson, Assistant Director for Urban and Community Forestry at U.S. Forest Service. Um, it's, it's, a, it's an honor and a pleasure to be here with you all today. Um, we have um, probably one of the most historic and exciting times in the history of this program taking place right now. But, um, you know, we continue to find it important to come out of our worker space and, and make sure that we are communicating out what is happening in this program, what's happening for communities and the opportunity for communities across the country, uh, and also how the Forest Service is leading the way in making sure we're building and making equity into access for those opportunities that are being created, the resources that are coming in. And so um, just wanted to give you all a, an update as to what we've been up to here in the national program, a little bit about who we are, uh, and also, I will um, make sure uh, I leave plenty of time for Dr. Doughton uh, to give her presentation because I am also a fan of her. So uh, with that, I will um, uh, say let's go into the slides. Quinn, Quinn Holyfield, one of my national program managers at U.S. Forest Service is joining us today. Uh, Quinn is uh, a magician behind the scenes um, because she is uh, just a fantastic partner in terms of getting information and, and outreach content uh, disseminated to any of our audiences who want to learn who want to learn more and know more about what we're doing. So next slide, please. Um, we're going to talk about this one is titled the dimensions of urban forestry. And so I found that peculiar because so much of what we've been doing has been um, real time scaling, scaling of a program that is um, over 30 years old. Um, and in 2022, 
came, we were a roughly $36 million fiscally appropriated program and um, saw a, a significant historic surge in funding through the Inflation Reduction Act. And so just a little bit about who we are. We are the only dedicated urban forestry program in the federal government. Um, we have been uh, reminded, especially most recently, about all the other programs that can work with communities or have um, make mention of green spaces. Uh, we know our we partnered and we I sit on committees with Department of Transportation, EPA, Department of the Interior, and even Housing and Urban Development. Uh, and we always cross think and thought have some thought partnership about how we can leverage each other's resources and cross market and cross advertise our opportunities. Um, but for what's unique about us inside of the U U.S. Forest Service is that uh, for the for the entire federal government, we are the program that's dedicated to getting resources and taking care of the health and well-being of the nation's urban forest. Um, we have uh, we are predominantly assisted. Uh, by our state forestry agencies. Uh, we have a pretty traditional cooperative forestry assistance program where we receive resources from our pro fiscally appropriated and we disseminate them through our state forestry agency partners there in Michigan. You have the Michigan DNR, Department of Natural Resources. Uh, and it, if still in the same role, Kevin Sayer is the Urban and Community Forestry Program Manager for the state of Michigan and has been a phenomenal partner um, and gotten a lot of work accomplished there in Michigan for you all. Um, in terms of how we are de delivering the work and what we're prioritizing, we're looking pretty heavily at nature-based solutions. You know, we're looking at communities that have been underserved and under-resourced. We're looking at communities that have for a long time um, not just been either engaged or had any planning designed around what the needs might be. And so we are taking the time in this historic funding opportunity Inflation Reduction Act brought us $1.5 billion. And so when we sum up all of that funding, we know that that's enough funding for to shape and form and invest in the next, go back one slide, please. Invest in the next 10 years of urban and community forests. And so we wanted to make sure that we are putting some priority around these communities. Um, you know, the funding opportunity we have right now, we're actually just closed on Sunday night at 11.59 PM Eastern time. Um, wanted to, um, it's a direct funding opportunity. It's an opportunity for communities, for municipalities, state agencies, nonprofit partners, faith-based institutions, tribal communities to receive direct funding to their community from the federal government or not, um, because we also are gonna work with pass-through partners to help us get these funds to the ground. Um, we've been, we, we, we designed the funding announcement around those communities that were suffering from the lowest canopy cover, dealing with dead and dead and dying and hazardous trees, uh, communities that were suffering from extreme heat uh, as a result of lack of a canopy cover and severe flooding. Um, and also taking a look at, you know, this wasn't just an environmental justice moment uh, that we received the Inflation Reduction Act funding through. We also saw an, an imperative and an urgency around economic justice. And so we have also taken the opportunity to amplify one of the authorities that we've had since the beginning of time is this program was created. And that is the ability to create job opportunities. And that is workforce training uh, and development and working to create the next generation of green job workforce when it comes to uh, nature equity, tree planting and maintenance in communities. Uh, we wanna help communities become more resilient of climate change, benefiting from cooler temperatures with through these trees being planted and green space installations. Uh, we know that with improved forest health conditions, we can see improved public health conditions. Uh, we wanna see safer access to nature, safer access to the benefits to tr of trees. Um, we want communities to have a nature and green space access within a short walking distance from where they reside and not dependent upon a far more distant recreation space. And then also, like I said, in terms of workforce and training and an economic opportunity, um, we have seen just a tremendous outpouring of interest from folks who wanna be part of this change, part of how we are um, sowing green space and green solutions into um, offsetting the challenges that we see with climate change. Next slide, please.
Well, while she works on the next slide, I will tell you that um, one of the things we talk about, oh, here it is, the benefits of Trees for All. So the funding opportunity, I wanted to back up a little bit and the funding opportunity we have uh, were just closed. And we are also in the process of just getting geared up to start a proposal review was the notice of funding opportunity for $1 billion. That's a historic funding level we were making, a, making available to deliver equitable access to trees and green spaces. Um, as I mentioned, human health is critical, environmental health and justice is critical. Um, we have a calling upon us and a prioritization upon us from the administration and also from our congressional leadership. They wanna see us also play a, how, see how this program can be part of the economic well-being and health and sustainability of communities. And so again, workforce training, planning assistance and making sure we're getting in those communities, but also making sure there's access and awareness. Um, we, I don't think, um, you know, our, our team has just started to stop and digest where we were just six or seven months ago. And at that time, I would say, I, I reminded them on last week, we had 264 names on our mail list when we got started. Uh, and just for our first webinar, we outsold a 2,000 person webinar and had more than 1,300 people live streaming uh, the webinar around our funding opportunity. And so just, I mean, they say life comes at you fast, but just in a blink of an eye, we have far exceeded the amount of reach that we thought we could make with a tiny footprint of a team. Um, and the country and our partners and those we haven't even met before have just shown up and showed us how important the work is we're doing and how they could use our authorities, our resources, the, the information that we share, the science, the cap all how we can how they can use that to improve conditions in their own community. And so that has just been helpful. And it's also helped us get away from being obsessed with identifying a blueprint that can just be copied and pasted everywhere. Uh, it's really allowing us to let communities show up how they wanna show up um, and, may, and invite them in a way where they feel like they belong in this space, belong working with us side by side and that they have access to our technical assistance, our financial assistance, administrative assistance, uh, and even the educational assistance. Um, we, have seen, we have seen communities retooling their workforce with these uh, tree planting and maintenance jobs. And so it's just a, it's a great opportunity for us to engage and be most close to the communities on the ground level. Next slide. Um, we are a Justice 40 covered program. Uh, the Justice 40 initiative is a result of an executive order from the Biden-Harris administration. And it speaks to how the federal, go federal government should be striving to put no less than 40% of the benefits of the resources it has access to um, and focus them on the most disadvantaged and under-resourced and underserved communities. Um, for us in urban and community forestry, we found this one pretty simple. Because of where we work and who we work with, we knew exactly where our clients, we knew the conditions as pretty, the data was available. And so we were one of the first to raise our hands and say, let's get it, let's be part of this. Um, and so for us as being part of a Justice 40, it also has served as a tailwind. And a reminder, anytime we think about going back to the traditional model and conforming to what we've always done, we always feel that, that responsibility around Justice 40 to say, you know what, let's make sure that Justice 40, 40% is the floor. It's actually, it's not the ceiling. And so we do have room, we have an opportunity to do more. And so as much good as we can provide and bringing communities up to the healthiest possible conditions, um, that is what we're striving to do. Uh, I always point to this picture, this is phenomenal because just surface temperatures, you know, when you're looking at what the, how hard trees work in urban areas, I've always said, uh, urban trees are some of the hardest working trees in the country because of how many people they are expected to provide relief and resources for, the benefits of these trees. And so it is so critical that we not just plant them, but maintain them so they can reach their full potential and that the existing trees in our communities don't get left behind for the new baby trees coming in, but that we put an adequate maintenance program in place to make sure that we are sustain, we're sustaining those trees and that they are more resilient to the pest and disease um, outbreaks that we are seeing across the country. 
Um, let's see, next slide, please. And we're frozen for a second. So I will say this, in terms of the 40% and us seeing the benefits flow, um, one thing I'll touch upon is that we have seen technology and just like that on cue, I told you Quinn was a magician. magician. Um, thank you, Quinn. What we've seen is technology being one of our best friends in this moment. We've had to lean in heavily on some of the equity tools that have been developed. Um, as some of you may be uh, familiar with the TREAT equity score that was developed by um, American Forest. We in the Forest Service for a very long time um, were part of the makers and investment partners and continue to hold the iTree software portfolio. Uh, we partner and collaborate with uh, Davy Tree on that software. The data in iTree is what a lot of the access, the awareness and the accessibility and advocacy tools back into. And so a lot of those metrics are coming through the best science and the best sciences in our iTree software. So the technology has given us a chance to put data and decision-making opportunities into the hands of those who just may not have had access to the expertise before. Pulling up an app on your phone and being able to see what your canopy cover score is versus a different side of town, it gives you a fighting chance when you walk into City Hall and ask for access to green space. But not just that, it educates, we're trying to help educate you on how you can not just green up to green up, but green up smart and green up resiliently, but also green up inclusively. What does the community want to see? There are very there are many ways we can be green solutions, but we want to make sure that the community's voice is in critical part of that. The CGES tool, the community, the climate and environmental justice screening tool, is a tool that was uh, deployed through the White House. It was the, originally the EJ screen, a screening tool through the through EPA. It was upgraded for um, the amount of climate and economic justice and environmental justice work that's going. Uh, coming through the funding opportunities that flowed from Congress, but also through the priorities of the Biden-Harris administration around environmental justice, racial equity, uh, and climate resilience. And these new tools are helping us uh, through maps, through backing up into the best science and the data that's taking place. And, and also just honestly, the technology has allowed us to keep abreast of the most recent updates and changes. It pulls data all the way down from the track of land and gives you that information and makes that declaration of not just that it's disadvantaged, for example, but why, the statistical and the science behind what is why. And so that's what we're most excited about is that we're not just coming with resources, but leveraging and layering them with the advocacy tools, the best science. Um, and then also just like I said, just a tremendous campaign around marketing, awareness, outreach, to ensure that as many people as possible know about the work that can be done through the Urban Community Forestry Program, and also the authorities and the way that we can function through the federal government dollar uh, and the ways that we disseminate our funds to get them as close to the ground as possible. Next slide. So we are working to disseminate this program and through a lens of equity and making sure that everyone knows that knows about it, but also feels welcome to be part of what we're building and what we're deploying. Um, this has been a phenomenal program. We've always known the potential of the program, but also knowing now that this program has received so many resources, it's also received so much attention. And with that attention has come an opportunity for us to see where we can do better, where we can serve more, and we can bring on more partners to help us do more good work. And so um, thank you uh, to Catherine for this opportunity to present and share about uh, the dimensions and where we are in urban community forestry, scaling up from a $36 million program uh, to receiving $1.5 billion, um, and just giving you a glimpse as to how that funding can be deployed across the country. That is what we are most excited about. And, and quite honestly, busy is doing, um, especially for the next few months as we get through uh, what has just been an, an enormous, enormous participation from across the country in our grant application opportunity. So with that being said, I'll turn it over to you, Catherine, so we can all hear and enjoy Dr. Dalton. Thank you very much, Beatra. And at this time, we will hand it over to Dr. Asia Dalton. 
Thank you, Catherine and Beatra. Um, and thank you to everyone who's able to join today. Really looking forward to sharing a little bit with you about um, some work that we've been doing in my group around standardizing data collection in urban and community forestry. But I've got to be very honest and share that um, a lot of this is really driven by thoughts around this IRA funding and really thinking about best ways that we can move forward as a discipline. So I'm looking forward to diving into that with you all today. Um, I can't do that though without co-signing what Beatrice said in terms of Quinn being a magician. She came through and, and was such a huge help even for me and getting my stuff together this morning. So I just wanna give uh, due credit where, where it's deserved. So before we dive into the lecture or the talk today, I'm just gonna ask if you take a quick trip with me down memory lane, uh, not too far back in the past, pretty recently and just you know, walk with me as I reflect on the past week of my life, right? And like, it might be like, why in the world would we do that? Well, honestly, because the past week of my life really for a large part revolved around this IRA funding. Um, spending a lot of time with a great group of, uh, I should say a great set of groups of colleagues um, who were all united and submitting proposals that were geared towards seeing if we could receive some uh, support to advance some of the work that we're doing in urban and community forestry in the state of Michigan, and then with partners that we've got across the US. And it was um, quite the time in terms of just being able to think creatively and almost in a way like without limit around what we could potentially do with that funding. It was a lot of work, a lot of collaboration and a lot of tunnel vision, if you will, right? A lot of us are in the field, have been in the field for years. And so we were kind of speaking each other's language catching on to and buying into each other's vision. And we were just kind of in our own, our silo, our own little silo, if you will. And so as all the work with like getting the proposals in for the IRA wrapped up last week, I had an opportunity to travel to the city of Nashville and work with some colleagues in the Green Communities Leadership Institute to continue some of our efforts around planning what a successful leadership program looks like for folks who are united around this idea of bringing and sustaining green spaces in cities. And so again, this was exciting and that it was a great group of people from across the country. We had a lot of space to think without limit around what we could do with the program. But at the same time, it was kind of my, my professional people, right? We were in a space where we kind of all spoke the same language around urban greening, realizing its value, wanting to make sure that other folks in the nation and the communities that we work in respectively could benefit from what we know to be the values of sustainable management of our green spaces and other natural resources in our urban areas. So again, this is wrapping up the week with this inundation of folks who care about a lot of the same things that I care about in my professional work. Then I had a chance to leave Nashville and travel to New York, which is where I'm from. And I got here and had an opportunity to spend time with friends from college as I uh, got a friend who's celebrating a new baby on the way and then came on out to Long Island where I grew up and spending time in a small community where again, I'm surrounded by my people, but the difference is the folks that I was able to spend time with at that baby shower in Queens and I'm now spending time with here back home on Long Island are very different if you will, in terms of where the focus is from the folks that I was writing those proposals with and, and planning these leadership institutes with, right? These are folks who, frankly, don't spend their days thinking about trees. They may pay them attention on a day-to-day -day basis, they may not, and that's, that's their business. But the reality of it is the folks that I'm staying with, the community that I'm in here um, on Long Island, the folks that I was reconvening with this weekend out in Queens, these are folks who comprise the very communities that we are promoting and really advocating for a large proportion of this IRA funding to benefit over the long term. And so, you know, just in reflecting over this past week, it really got me thinking like, how do, how do we really bridge the divide, right? We know that we want this funding to benefit communities that have been under-resourced and underserved for many years. And I think that that is well-intentioned, but I think we have to be very cognizant of the fact that not everyone, but a lot of times in these communities, what we prioritize in the urban forestry world may not necessarily be top of mind in these communities. And so it's really, you know, as we move into the distribution of this funding and the great work that's going to be done, I think that it really puts us in a place where we have to think honestly and openly about engaging with these communities, my community, communities like the ones I grew up in, in a way that's meaningful um, and impactful over the long run. 
Um, and so, you know, again, spending time reflecting over the past couple of days, I've been thinking about that. I've been thinking about like, if we're going to be bridging the divide between those of us who have been in our urban forestry silos for years, or for some, maybe our, the entirety of our careers, that's great. And there's folks who have been in the communities like the ones I grew up in for years. And we need to now get to the page where we're speaking the same language. So I've been thinking also, like, as we start thinking about speaking the same language, what, what does that language look like? What are the messages that we want to communicate that we need to be listening to? What's the information that we need to be sharing? Um, and then at the same time, be open to receiving from the community. Really been thinking about how can we get to common ground in terms of collecting data, um, reporting that data, sharing it out. And that data is kind of bi-directional. It's data on our urban and community forests, and it's data on the people who live and breathe and work and just enjoy their lives in the communities where our urban forests exist. Been also thinking about how do we train up the next generation of urban foresters, right? These communities are going to be here forever. This money, hopefully, there's a. this is the first of many waves of investment. But as the waves continue to flow, if you will, we have to make sure that there's sustainability and who's going to be leading these communities and making sure that whoever represents that future workforce is as representative of the communities that this funding is intended to benefit. And then in the midst of all of that, how do we really begin to think about what type of work we're going to prioritize as we move into really this new era in urban and community forestry? And so that these questions, these reflections really set the stage for um, some of the conversations that I'm going to be having with you all over the next few minutes. Um, and so just to provide an overview of where we're going to go with this talk, um, thinking about that common language, how do we get to the same, the, the space of communicating the same things and doing so effectively? Um, we're going to dive into that and really uh, spend some time exploring some preliminary thoughts that are coming out of my research group around, you know, what are, how can we standardize our practices in urban forest or urban forest inventory data collection? And how do we utilize that to, again, make sure that as this money's being invested, we're doing so in a way that makes sense and is a benefit to the communities that we're working with, but that on a grander scale is universally of benefit to all of us who share um, urban forest resources across the US. And we'll do that, we'll dive into that conversation using some uh, case-based data that we've got out of Michigan. And then we'll switch gears uh, briefly before we wrap today and talk about how do we take this information and make sense of it in light of everything that's happening with the IRA and everything that's bound to happen over the next couple months and five to 10 years with the influx of this money? So with that being said, let's dive into standardizing data collection um, and just some thoughts that we've got in my research group based, um, based in Michigan. So to give you uh, some background as to like what motivated this question, even beyond the reflections of this past week, um, we've been, for some time now, um, some students of mine really going into depth looking at urban forest management plans across the state of Michigan for various reasons. Uh, we've got a project that's looking at how there, what similarities and differences there may be in terms of how we prioritize ecosystem service uh, provision by way of our urban forest and how that's represented in our plans. But we've also been using our this assessment of our plans to get an idea of like, how comprehensively is data reported in these plans? And is there any form of uniformity or discrepancy in how data is reported, what data is reported? And then how can we use that information to really get a good assessment of the trees that we have in our Michigan municipalities and then making strategic plans at a state level as to how we can best manage those trees so that everyone can benefit from them. And so that also led us to thinking about if we're gonna take in that information, we have to actually understand what is in our urban forest? What trees are present? How diverse, um, how biologically diverse are they? And what does that mean for how we need to shift our prioritization for planting strategies, management strategies? And I think more, most, most importantly in this IRA era, uh, community engagement strategies. So in terms of how we've been diving into this plan assessment, we've taken the time to work with our state partner, Beatra mentioned earlier, Kevin Sayers, um, phenomenal partner of ours at Michigan DNR, who's helped us to sort of scavenge and see what type of, what plans do we have available for us to dive into um, at a state level. And I just wanna give uh, Kevin a lot of thanks for helping us to acquire a lot of the plans in our study. And then we did things the semi old fashioned way and did a lot of Google searching, um, trying to see what we could pick up off of the internet. 
and ended up with about 40 plans from communities across the state that we've uh, included in this study. And let's see, you can, you can kind of see it here. Our plans range in um, spatial distribution, if you will. So this plan from Houghton, Houghton is up in the uh, UP. And then there's also some representation age-wise, like the Houghton plan is from 2005. The Flint plan is from 2015 and Ann Arbor is from 2014. So we've got some age, if you will, distribution and then um, geographic representation. And so again, we took a deep dive into all of our plans, went in, did a, a really nice content analysis, again, pulling out different pieces of information for different studies. But for this study in particular, we had to figure out, okay, we can pull out all this information, that's great, but what exactly can we use to make sense of it? And for assessing like the comprehensiveness of how data is actually collected and represented, and when I say data, I'm speaking specifically here about our tree inventory data, uh, we decided that we were gonna move into the direction of creating our own little metric called the Tree Diversity Reporting Index. Um, it's got a fancy equation, but really it's just our way of identifying some key criteria that we wanted to see in each plan. And then, you know, going through each plan and seeing, did you, did you report on this particular criterion? There were seven in total, uh, including species composition, species richness, genus composition, genus richness, condition rating of our trees, size or age class distribution, and then condition rating by size or age class. And for each uh, of those criterion, if a plan actually included that, or if the inventory data in a plan included that, we gave it a point of one. And long story short, any plan could get a maximum TDRI score of seven, for again, reporting on each of those criteria or minimum score of zero if none of that were, um, were included. So we'll dive into some results really quickly to show you what we're dealing with here in Michigan. You can see we had a range of scores from the plans that we looked into, ranging from about 17% of our plans that didn't report any inventory data and of more than 67% of our, or around 67% of our plans that were relatively comprehensive and their collection and reporting of tree inventory data with them receiving TDRI scores of four or higher. Meaning that out of those seven criteria, they reported data on four or more of them. So we're like, okay, that's actually a good thing. That means by and large, there's, a, there's an overwhelming trending, if you will, in the state of Michigan of plans being moderately comprehensive when it comes to reporting that tree inventory data. And I'll just give you a quick spoiler alert that this may seem relatively simple, but as we think about moving forward with the IRA and making the most sound investments in our communities, you know, in, our, in my research group, we're of the mindset that the best way to do that and the most impactful way to do that is to have good data at the onset so that you know what you have and then you can be strategic about how you um, move forward with modifying your management and your expansion strategies and plans for your urban forest. So that's the spoiler alert. We'll come back to that point in just a few minutes, but I wanna highlight again, most of our plans are relatively comprehensive in their reporting of tree inventory data. That's cool. Comprehensive, comprehensiveness is great, but the other thing that we were really interested in is, oh, is like, okay, they're reporting this data, but what components of the urban forest are actually being represented in this data? And so we started to look and ask, like, are we just seeing reporting of data from along rights of ways? Or are we seeing a broader, more inclusive approach to collecting this tree inventory data? And the numbers were kind of all over the place here. Um, about 40% of our plans focused specifically on reporting that um, right of way data. And it's kind of decreasing from there. So you can see we have so about 20% of our plans that included inventory data for right of ways and public parks. Um, and it's just fewer and fewer, a smaller and smaller proportion of plans that were like fully inclusive of everything that's in, you know, all the trees that comprise the urban forest. Fewer and fewer plans actually included that level of detail. Again, thinking about the implications, like, okay, these are just plans in Michigan, but what does this tell us and about where we are with our data collection and how can this guide what we may do moving forward Again, part of this IRA funding, part of a main driver in how the funding is distributed is thinking about inclusion, right? I think that it's important for us to be inclusive, even down to the level of the data that we collect for our urban forest so that we can understand, again, how do we better target our planting initiatives, our 
modify management strategies. And you can't do that in my, um, in my purview without, again, having a great starting point. And that great starting point really does tie back to having sound, comprehensive inventory data. So I'll speed through some of the rest of these slides in the interest of time, but I'll just give you some quick highlights of some findings that may, may be of interest. Um, looking at species richness, and we did an assessment again of all the, the uh, plans that we had. We saw that we had the lowest number of species in our uh, community Franklin with only 27 species accounted for. And then as many as 228 species in Rochester Hills. And then on average, per municipality, we have about 102 species that comprise the urban forest. Again, this is important just thinking about, all right, we're going to be needing to plant and manage trees from the perspective of urban forest resilience. If we have a greater richness of our species, this puts us in a position to do that and to be thinking about what we can anticipate in terms of threats that may come down the line or how we need to increase that species richness so that we can be all the more resilient moving forward. In terms of our uh, genera count, same difference, smaller number in the community of Franklin with only 21 genera uh, present. And then in Ann Arbor, we had as many as 82. When we look at the species that are well represented in urban forests around the state of Michigan, I would assume that it actually probably mirrors a lot of what's observed in urban forests across the US and maybe more so uh, east of the Mississippi. But you can see here, we've got just this um, notable abundance of various maple species, and then things will sort of taper down beyond that point. When we looked at the most abundant species and sort of picked out our top five, um, this may come as no surprise to many, um, but just again, this overabundance of Norway maple and followed behind uh, not too far by red maple. And then uh, there's abundance to a lesser degree, but still very notable and, and uh, enough sort of, again, kind of force us into that more strategic tree selection mindset, um, but relatively abundant abundance, relative abundance, pretty high for sugar maple, silver, silver maple, and thornless honey locusts across our municipalities around the state. So what does this look like um, when we plan it out? Again, moving up from the genus level, I'm sorry, from the species level to the genus level. I'll just show you just a breakdown of um, genus composition for communities and apologies as this is relatively small in print, but I think you can pretty much see the message loud and clear here. Um, in almost every single community that we have data for, there is again, um, this overabundance of acer or maple trees. And this uh, horizontal solid line here represents the 20% line. Um, and just kind of thinking about that 10, 20, 30 rule where we don't really want to see more than 20% of any one genus represented among the tree cover of any community. You can see here that um, by and large, we're not passing that in any of these towns or the municipalities for which we have data. So again, as we start thinking about investing this IRA money, making sure that folks get the benefits of trees and that they're able to do so for a long amount of time, um, we can utilize data like this to be very strategic in selecting species that are going to diversify our urban tree cover and that are going to be resilient to pests that are um, predicted to be of impact in the coming years. So on that same um, mindset of resilience, um, we started looking at size class distribution, which can serve as a proxy for age. And, um, and you can see here a couple of things that I wanted to point out. So in an idealistic world, you'd have a steady decrease from your juvenile trees to your more mature trees um, to ensure that you've got you know, a, a steady influx of, of growth, if you will, and aren't relying too heavily on tree cover that is toward end of life because essentially those trees will die. You don't wanna be left with a void, if you will, or decreasing uh, urban tree cover. So in a perfect world, you see your um, greater representation for the smaller size classes, and then a steady decrease um, as you get into the more mature classes. And you can see that we have that for some of our communities, but at the same time, you can also see that we don't. There are some communities where there's a significant proportion of the tree cover is in that uh, that uh, establishing uh, stage of life, if you will. Other things that I wanted to point out here, we're thinking about comprehensiveness, we're thinking about how this data is recorded. If you just take a quick look at this data, you can see that there's, there's really minimal consistency 
and how we're actually like recording this data. So for Ann Arbor, for example, this is where I've got my pointer um, kind of under. We've got three size classes ranging from zero to five inches, then six to 20 inches, then greater than 21 inches. Okay. Then we come over to a community like Big Rapids and we've got as many as, what is this, nine or so classes uh, for our size. And again, this may seem relatively small, but think about what happens when we cluster this data. We may not be getting the best representative, representative data of what we've got in terms of size or age of our trees. And this may be putting us at a disadvantage for understanding what the potential risk or threats may be or where we may need to be very strategic and targeted in our planting initiatives. And so this kind of puts us on alert on, you know, maybe we can work towards a more standardized way of classifying our size class um, so that across the board, we know where various municipalities are in terms of, again, the age structure of their forest, the urban forest, and how planting strategies can be uh, planned behind that. And this is just additional data on um, other municipalities. And then last but not least, we looked into condition rating. And, and one thing that I liked about this is 93% of the plans that did have inventory data, there was some form of condition rating that was reported. And across the board, across the state, more than 75% of trees in our municipalities were rated fair to good, if not better. So that was, um, that was encouraging. And one thing that we did see in the analysis of this data is that while we've got a high reporting or high rate of reporting for condition rating, the ways in which condition rating was reported, far from universal, um, honestly kind of hard to make comparisons between municipalities, in part because there weren't necessarily um, the definitions given for municipalities. And, and the number of classes that were utilized ranged from three all the way up to eight, and so it's like when we call a tree, if we say a tree is in good condition, does it mean the same in Detroit as it does in Grand Rapids? And does that mean the same as it does in maybe Sioux Falls, you know, South Dakota? These are these are questions that we're starting to raise. And I think it's a good time to raise because again, we're getting all this money. We want the money to do good things. It would be really helpful if we're all on the same page around how we communicate the good things that the, this, this investment is gonna do in communities across the US. And then just one quick anecdote here about this um, condition rating. There's one community, which I have, I've got a couple of friends that live there, I actually really like the community, um, but they said that 73% of their urban tree cover was in excellent condition. And I'm not saying that's not true, but I am questioning how they define excellent. And so again, we've got to get on the same page with how we talk about our urban forest cover. So just to summarize our findings overall, um, across the state, I'm a little biased, but I'm going to say two thumbs up for Michigan. We're doing good work in terms of being very comprehensive in our collection of tree inventory data. At the same time, there's definitely some room for improvement. And I would I would uh, offer that there's, this may be true of other states across the country as well. And where we could see some of this improvement might be in terms of being a little bit more um, consistent, if you will, um, in our comprehensive coverage of the components of urban forests that are inventoried, that is, let's let's scale it up. Like maybe we do go beyond just collecting data for our right of ways. Like maybe it's time for us to, again, be inclusive. Let's get the trees in in our parks. Let's get the trees on all publicly managed property. Um, there's also room for us to be a little bit more clarify, uh, clear and consistent with how we talk about or report our size class uh, data, and the same for our condition rating data. And again, now we think about, okay, these are great findings for Michigan, but how do we apply these findings at the state level? And to you know, borrow some of the actress language, how do we scale this up moving forward? I think we, within our state, but again, in states across the US really use this information to put us in a position to be strategic, to be all the more strategic in a justifiable manner around our tree selection so that we can meet our biodiversity goals. Um, but then also to help us be very strategic in how we care for our trees. If we have better data around the condition of our trees or the age of our trees, then that will help us to be very wise in how we invest our money um, towards management strategies and, and to make sure that we're doing that in a manner that's equitable so that it's not just all this money going to the trees downtown because that's where all the shoppers go. The money needs to go to the parts of the community where folks may not have historically been, you know, invited into urban forestry conversations and workforces. And so um, 
that's just a key takeaway that we've been thinking about in, in our research group. So just on that same vein, um, kind of parlaying that into just a bigger conversation around applications for advancing urban forestry in the IRA era. I think that as we move forward as a community and, you know, again, just kind of building off of what Beatrice said, there's, there's like unprecedented interest in this field and there's nothing wrong with that. Um, but that means that our community just got way bigger overnight and it's probably gonna be a lot bigger for the foreseeable future. So as we have this growing community, we think I think it's important for us to be united around some goals, some objectives and some ways of thinking and or doing things. Um, and to that note, I would say like, as we move forward, let's collectively prioritize collecting and analyzing not just any old data, but making sure that it's good data around our urban tree cover, that is high quality data, and, and being really intentional about that now on the forefront or on the front end of this um, investment of funding, so that five, 10 years from now, when we're like assessing, you know, what, what all happened? What was the good that this funding really created across the nation? We can say, we can track it because we had the good data on the front end, we're all speaking the same language on the front end and on the back end, we can all like universally assess just how phenomenal this funding has been for changing the culture um, at a national level when it comes to urban forestry. Again, just I will be uh, probably, um, I won't apologize about making this point time and time again, but um, as we're collecting this data, let's make sure that we are as comprehensive as possible in the collection of this data. Um, and I'll, again, this is a little bit of a spoiler alert, but when I'm saying comprehensive, I'm not, yes, we spend all that time looking at the tree data. We need to be as comprehensive as possible about collecting data from our trees and our communities. But remember, these are communities where people live, work, and play, and we need to be able to collect data and get information and invite folks to share information um, in the communities where our trees are going to be planted. Again, whether we're talking about tree data or data that we'll get from our community collaborators. Um, and when I say data, I'm not talking about like stuff that you can put into a system and analyze for statistics, but just information, conversations, or you know, traditional tree data. In the process, we need to be making sure that it's that whatever we're collecting is high quality um, and is, it's used to really guide decisions around tree selection and management. And it's not here on the slide, but it's coming up on the next one but also community engagement. So again, knowing what we have in our urban forests is important, making sure we have the highest level quality of data that we have even ways in place to communicate that data in a way that makes sense for folks who may not have gone to MSU or any other school, but they do live and work and play in these communities where these trees are present. Like let's be really intentional on the front end about making this data as comprehensive and as representative as possible but also as accessible as possible. And I think in so doing, we'll be able to make sure that we're fulfilling the mission of the IRA funding, which is engaging the community in the work that we do. Um, again, our community inventory from the time that you get this funding, and even if you don't get this funding, like whatever you do in urban and community forestry, make sure that the level of investment that you would put into comprehensively inventorying your urban tree cover, you also put into comprehensively inventory in your community. And that in like a voltaristic, I just need your input to keep getting this money kind of way, but in a way to make sure that whatever time investments, financial investments, whatever is being invested into these communities is of ultimate benefit to the folks who live there um, and will beyond any funding opportunity. Beyond that, we wanna make sure that again, our inventory community data inventory is comprehensive and inclusive. What that can look like may change from community to community, but at a minimum, everyone should have opportunities to come to the table. Maybe it's a literal table where there's food, where folks can talk about their interests, their relationship to trees in the community, um, whether that's been good or bad, or their vision for trees in the community. Um, but there's gotta be space made to do that and to do that consistently over the course of the funding period. And of course that takes time to do correctly, so budget for that on the front end, you'll have the data that you'll need for the long term to make uh, decisions and to do work that's really of best benefit to the community. And make sure that that community is in, included in all aspects of everything related to the urban forest that we're um, in a new position to invest in in new ways. So that's everything from tree selection and management 
to cultural practices and activities that the community would like to be a part of um, as it relates to the urban forest and the broader urban ecosystem. And last but not least, uh, before we go into conclusions, you know, sometimes engaging the community will look like, again, let's, let's break bread together, share ideas, plan out things together. And all that stuff is, is empowering on an individual level. But um, again, tying back into some of the core values of the IRA funding, you also want to make sure that you are investing into the community in ways that benefit them on, a, on an economic level. We all have bills to pay and families to support. And so as we're being inclusive and engaging the communities in this work, the, some of that means making sure that the community can engage in this work in a professional manner that allows them to move up the ranks um, economically, professionally, and in a way that ties back to where they live, work, and play. Um, so just a, an encouragement and a nod, or just a little push to all of us to make sure that we are consistently investing in workforce development opportunities that are inclusive of folks, regardless of where they may be economically, educationally, or for, uh, with respect to any other status um, that may characterize their lives. Asia, I just want to make, just quickly note that we only have eight minutes left. Okay, and I got one and a half slides, so we're going to wrap up very quickly. Um, so yeah, last but not least, just to conclude, um, between the work that we went over with the Michigan plans and these uh, thoughts around applications or things to consider as we move into the IRA funding, just want to leave with three quick points, and that is that, like, again, this is unprecedented funding, which means that this isn't an, an unprecedented opportunity for us to really advance the work that we do in urban forestry, which means that it's a, an opportune time for us to really um, incre increase the strategy and the standardization in which we collect inventory data and um, make it available to, to all and use it to make decisions about our urban forest that will benefit all. And um, the collection of our inventory data should be comprehensive and inclusive. That's undeniable but of equal value. And what I'd ask all of us to remember today is that that inventory data should also include collecting data, getting information, making space for the community to, to share their, their uh, views, their thoughts, and to contribute to this um, ongoing stewardship of our urban forest as well. So with that, I just wanna close out, say thank you for your time. Um, thanks to my collaborators, including uh, Kevin Sayers at Michigan DNR, and the support of the DNR through the Partnership for Ecosystem Research and Management. Uh, for India Hunt, who's a former student, but now Forest Service uh, employee, who's been uh, a great help in getting this together. And then Daph Magato, who was uh, really instrumental in collecting those plans way back on the early stages of this process. Thank you. Thank you both Asia and Beatra um, for presenting. And at this time, we're gonna jump into the Q&A portion of the webinar. Um, we've been monitoring our chat feature and email, and we ask that you please continue to submit any questions that you have in the chat box or in the email. Um, my first question that I have is for Beatra. I was wondering what tools does the Forest Service have to advocate for the inclusion of and empowerment of community members in the planning and implementation process of um, projects funded through the urban and community forestry program? Yeah, thanks. Great question. So in terms of tools, um, I, I probably have been asked or introduced to a concept of a toolkit a uh, hundred times in the past year, and certainly since the Inflation Reduction Act funding came out. Uh, a couple of things I'd like to point to. One, I would say in terms of tools, it's our original, which is our iTree software. Um, it is a bit scientific. It is a bit technical. But through partners like American Forest come spinning off with the tree equity score and other partners who we see are introducing different ways for communities to disseminate information and advocate for themselves. I would say uh, the best part of it is that we know we're investing in the best science and knowing that those different tools are backing into iTree, well, they're, they're as good as gold. We're seeing um, a lot of mapping tools, uh, a lot of mapping platforms that are being made available. Um, so we've seen um, external partners like Planet Geo provide a lot of their information and they do a lot of webinar series as well and provide a lot of technical information to help communities better understand how they can get their precision, more precise decision making on the ground. Uh, we're also seeing um, 
I think it was uh, Google that came out with a feature. That's not our forest service tool, but just to see the corporate community come together and want to be part of helping communities make better decisions for their green spaces or get more access to their green spaces. Um, so, and then also I would say that we have um, a platform called the Vibrant Cities Lab. And if you Google it, it's the only one that'll come up and we collaborate with our partners at American Forest to uh, host that. Uh, they host the, the lab on a platform that helps us provide case studies, um, interviews, um, imagery, other scientific information and articles that can help communities who may be starting this work, wanting to go to the next level with this work, are looking for sources, uh, professional sources, or even their state or federal partners that they can get some affordable or free technical assistance from. So those are some of the quick ones and low-hanging opportunities I, I think I would point folks to. Thank you. Um, the next question is um, for Dr. Doughton. Um, with respect to species richness, um, one of our participants was wondering what percentage of trees have you been seeing that are invasive? That's a good question. I think honestly, for what we've looked at in our plans, most haven't been. It, it would be relatively low outside of, you know, Norway maple. I, I don't want to just throw a number on there and, and make up something, but I think we, you know, our one of our biggest culprits is Norway maple. So it's like it's a relatively low percentage if you will, in terms of all of the species that we have seen. But when we think about the abundance of that one species across the landscape, I think it kind of, it, it's, it's overrepresented to say the least. And I guess as a follow-up to that, um, knowing that invasive is not necessarily um, a bad thing when you start to think about um, climate resilience, um, are urban foresters having to consider different heat tolerant tree species or, you know, climate resilient species um, for planting in the future? Yes, absolutely. And I've got um, some Forest Service colleagues who are doing um, some very uh, spectacular work with that, including uh, Max Fiana and Rich Hallett. And they've been looking at um, like a, assisted migration to really look at are there species that may do well in warmer climates, if we were to plant trees from those species in more northern climates where there are predict like certain predictions on how warm it's going to get, are those trees possibly able to survive here? And, and so they've got some really um, interesting ongoing studies in that realm right now. And I think um, it's, it's become a budding area of research in forestry. And I think we're on path to see some um, impressive results that will help us to make even more strategic selection of our tree species moving forward. Um, another question that we have is uh, specifically for Asia. Um, do you have any recommendations for introducing um, discussions about tree planting resources or um, Community, um, community science data collection or benefits of um, urban forests in, in communities that historically have not enjoyed the benefits of a more dense tree canopy without overwhelming um, those communities or turning those communities off? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. And I think um, this question has come up a couple of times in my class and I've been actually really um, encouraged by the direction that the conversation has gone. And I think I'm going to tap into that for this answer. Yes, the resources are out there, but I would say before diving into the instructions of what to do, it would be really helpful to sit and, and learn a little bit more about the work or the ways that folks in those communities do engage with trees. It may not be like they know how to, you know, properly mulch a tree after you plant it or an irrigation strategy, but they do know that like I'll, I'll give an example from a group in Detroit, the way that um, it's Rescue My Nature Now, and they've talked about how they communicate the benefits of trees to their uh, like residential stakeholders. And it's like, it's hard to come up to somebody who doesn't speak this language and say, oh, you got to plant these trees because of the stormwater mitigation benefits. Like that doesn't register, right? But, or it might not register, but what they have used in conversation is 
you all like to cook out a lot and that's what's up. It brings a lot of folks to the house. But did you ever realize how frequently it floods when, it, when in your backyard prior to these cookouts? Think about how much less that may happen if you planted a few more trees in your backyard. We, and then that opens the door for the conversation of the different ways that trees help to sort of mitigate flood risk and whatnot. So I would, I would recommend just taking the time again to learn what, what matters in those respective communities and then not necessarily talking in a prescriptive manner, but in a way that's a lot more relatable. Um, my next question is back to Beatra, and it's still kind of in that same vein of toolkits. Um, one participant has asked if there is a field guide in the works from USFS on data collection and reporting recommendations um, for projects that are utilizing IRA funding. Um, let's see, the short answer is no. Um, because you asked for specific to projects that will be deployed off of IRA funding. But what I do know is that we are in the process of developing a reporting tool, a public facing reporting tool. And so, apologies, my allergies and, and the air quality together today, um, it's ready to take me out. Um, so I would say for Inflation Reduction Act funded projects specific, we are looking for, uh, we are in the process of planning for a reporting tool that's public facing that will allow communities to enter their information, tell their stories, provide us images, and a way for us to help them be successful in not just getting this investment so it won't be one time, sustaining this investment for years to come. So um, stay tuned. I guess I would say we have been locked in on trying to get this funding um, deployed and available to the public. And now we are just starting the review process, but we are trying to walk and chew gum at the same time. So stay tuned, it's coming. Okay, and with that, I am just noticing that we are three minutes over. Um, and so I, I'd like to thank our speakers once again for your time and the information you've shared. Um, again, the webinar will be recorded and or was recorded and the recording and the slides will be posted on our website in a few days. And then I also ask that you please keep an eye out for that postseason survey. Again, we'd love to hear from you, love to hear about what we're what we did well, how we can improve and who else you'd like to hear from. And lastly, to be included on our mailing list to receive registration details and information regarding the upcoming 23-24 Learning Exchange Series, please email forestc at msu.edu. And I hope you all have a wonderful afternoon.